Mark? Why has Mark chosen Islamic finance? Yeah, uh, well, I think there, there, are, there are a few points here I could cover. So one is obviously the opportunity in Uzbekistan is massive. You know, it's a, it's a 35 million people market and there are pretty much no Islamic financial product products um, you know exist that exist. I think I think there was a one of the DFI, I think it was ADB that did the research. And uh, you know, the lack of Islamic products is one of the main reasons Uzbeks don't actually use banking products. Um, so that's on one hand. And on the other hand, it's not just Uzbekistan, you know, this problem is um, is very serious in other markets, in most of the frontier markets where most of the Muslims are actually based. So I think there are about 700 million Muslims like worldwide that are digitally connected, that are young, but they don't use banking products, whether it's credit or deposits. And so this is really the opportunity we are going after. And if you look at the traditional finance, you know, traditional financial services sector, you know, if you go into US, you, know, you go to Russia, UK, you do have you know, very, a lot of very strong fintech players that are, you know, um, sort of doing what the banks, the traditional banks don't do because banks are usually sort of the last to, you know, adapt, you know, any new technologies. But like in the Islamic countries, you don't, you know, I think most of the Islamic world has been sort of left behind. There haven't been that many like fintech innovators and banks have been quite slow. So we just see, you know, we just see a massive opportunity there, you know, first in Uzbekistan, which, you know, Uzbekistan alone, uh, you know, it's it's a massive market by itself, but then you know, obviously you have this big opportunity worldwide. Is Uzbekistan market large enough to fund a fintech startup with billion dollar valuation? It would be good. I mean, uh, you know, look at Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is twice smaller than Uzbekistan in terms of population, and look at what Kaspi has been able to achieve over the last few years. I mean, it's a company you know valued at I think six or seven billion dollars right now, and um, you know that's again that's uh, the market is half of Uzbekistan size, so we don't necessarily need to expand outside of Uzbekistan to build a billion dollar company or even ten billion dollar company, uh, but I mean of course you know we don't want to be limited to Uzbekistan. Why have you chosen business sector based on installment payments? Yeah, I mean, good question. Um, I think there are a few reasons behind that. I mean, one, if you look at the BNPL market as a whole, like internationally, I mean, that's the market that has been rapidly growing over the last few years. And the reason why it's growing so fast is also the reason I pointed, to, pointed out earlier, is just the banks, traditional banks, Islamic banks, I mean, any bank, they have been really slow at adopting new technologies and building really you know, customer-friendly, user-friendly solutions. Which is why, like in the U.S., you know, you have a company like a firm that um, you know has built, a, I think, a ten or fifteen billion dollar business over the last, you know, eight years or so. You have companies like Klarna uh, in Europe, which is the most expensive um, startup in Europe, uh, and then you have Afterpay in Australia. So those are the people that saw this problem, this gap in the market that the banks were not addressing, uh, which is really, you know, the lack of user-friendly um, installment solution at the point of sale, you know, and they've been able to tackle those problems and they, they've been able to build those, you know, incredible businesses. And of course, you know, uh, that's how it usually works like in the tech world, you know, first it's US, you know, China, those, you know, the, the, the more developed countries, uh, but then the frontier markets are usually the last ones to jump on the train. And I think that's what we are seeing, what we are seeing happening right now in Southeast Asia, in the MENU region, here in Central Asia. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, also BNPL is just a good product to start with uh, because, you know, it's a smaller ticket size, you know, it's, we don't need as much funding to fund, you know, the purchases of, you know, iPhones or, you know, purchases of vacuum cleaners. Uh, it's not the same as dealing with, you know, auto loans or, you know, real estate. So it's a good place to start. It's easy. It's also, it also helps you to build a credit scoring system, you know, because it's uh, uh, when you issue loans, you know, $50, $50 you know, um, all that repayment data that you receive, it goes into your credit scoring algorithm, which basically improves, you know, by using machine learning and AI. So uh, I think we just think it's a, it's a good place to start. 
Uzbekistan. What's your opinion on installment business in Uzbekistan? Uh, I think people are smart, you know, local entrepreneurs are smart, they see the opportunity. Um, the issue we see, I think, I mean, it's very easy to originate loans or originate installments, you know, it's very straightforward to originate. The problem is actually with servicing those loans or installments. And I think that's really where most of the companies, you know, struggle with. And the issue here is that you see most of the retailers, they try to do lending themselves. They try to originate loans, they try to do scoring themselves and the service loans. But then at some point they realize it's not really their business. You know, it's very different. You know, it's not retail. Retail, retail and finance are completely different businesses, which, um, which I think slowly people are starting to realize. And I think that's really where we come in. You know, when we see those merchants that used to do lending themselves, but they're really struggling you know, with dealing with high NPLs, you know, uh, basically not really getting the result they wanted and basically actually just losing money from offering those, you know, the loans or your installments. Uh, uh, that's an opportunity for us, you know. We can solve this problem for the merchants and at the same time, you know, this solves problem for our end users, which have, you know, access to, uh, again, to very user-friendly um, installment solutions that are also compliant um, you know, with their faith. Um, so, yeah. What's your advice to people who want to start a business with 1,000 or 10,000 and 100,000 dollars? Okay. Um, no, that's a really good question. I think this is something everyone should, I mean, even if you have $100 savings, I mean, this is something you should be thinking about. Um, so to answer your question, I would like to think from the sort of asset allocation point of view. And before you make that investment decision, you have to first think what is your risk tolerance, right? And risk tolerance usually depends on, you know, sort of your personality, but then also on how old you are, sort of what your investment horizon is and what your investment needs are. So, you know, if you're a student, you know, you're young, you have a long investment horizon, you probably, you'll, you'll probably have a high risk tolerance than let's say if you are, you know, older, you have a family, and your, girl, your, goal, your main goal is mostly to preserve your capital and, of course, to generate some returns. Um, so once you decide like, sort of where your risk tolerance is, then you can think about how you're going to allocate, you know, you know, whether it's like $100, you know, $1,000, $10,000. If you have a high risk tolerance, you want to invest more sort of in high risk investments like equities, uh, if you low, if it's low risk tolerance, then you want to look for you know uh, low risk instruments like bonds or you know uh, P2P investments, which which sort of lie, lie in the bet in between. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very individual question. I think in general, um, once once you once you understand what your risk tolerance is, your first step should be look at the, your opportunity set. Okay, like in Uzbekistan, you know, honestly, you don't have that many investment opportunities available. Like you have stocks, you have, um, you can go to the bank, uh, and then you have, yeah, then you have, you know, the new investment products that are coming up, like like the pro the product that we built, and then of course, yeah, you can always just store your cash under the mattress, which I would not recommend to you. Um, so I think, yeah, the high, if if you, I mean. Um, so what I find attractive about products like ours is that on the risk spectrum, it's on the low, or say on like the left-hand side of the spectrum. So it's relatively low risk. It's definitely low risk. It's less volatile than equities. And at the same time, the returns are quite high. Um, it, you know, it's higher than you, what you would get in a you know, bank deposit. So I think this is sort of a good place to start. I would not recommend anyone to put, you know, 100% of their portfolio in like any asset, you know, whether it's equities or bank deposits or our platform. Uh, but I think if you have, um, you know, if, if, you want, if you have a long-term investment horizon, if you want to preserve your high capital and also generate returns, I think, um, you know, products like ours is, is a good place to start. But then, of course, you want to diversify. You want to put a portion into you know, uh, equities, you want to put a portion into uh, maybe commodities, you know, or cryptocurrencies if you have a higher risk tolerance. Uh, 
So yeah. And then of course, you know, we, this is I was speaking more about let's say a uh, portfolio of one thousand dollars, you know, ten thousand dollars. If you have a much higher portfolio, so if it's hundred thousand dollars or one million dollars, then you have more options, right? Then you can maybe look into investing in a um, in a fund, you know, like a private equity fund. Maybe you can look into buying real estate. Maybe you can look into investing in a startup. Again, I wouldn't put like you know all the all my eggs into one basket. Uh, but like for us, you know, when we speak to investors, you know, who are uh, who have you know a million dollars that we can to allocate, then for them we can offer you know an option to invest in us, uh, both in the installments to come in as, as a sort of the P2P investor, uh, but they can also invest equity uh, in the man in, in the man group. Um, while like for smaller ticket size investments investors. Um, you know, we, we would definitely recommend them to start with investing um, through our invest platform because, you know, the minimum ticket size is uh, $10, right? How can one detect a business based on a PRM scheme? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because there were, I mean, there were, unfortunately, there have been quite a few cases, you know, of uh, some companies, you know, posing like legit investment companies, but basically ended up you know, they ended up as being a Ponzi schemes. So what I would look for, I mean, I would go back to the criteria that I already mentioned. Uh, I think those would be good starting points. Of course, if you can't find any information on the founders, if there is no team section on the website, that's a red flag. Um, you know, if they're promising you some excessively high returns, if they're saying you'll be generating 100% a year on your investment, that's also a red flag. Um, and then, yeah, you could look at the legal side of things, look at where the company is registered, uh, maybe try to speak some of the investors that have already invested with, the, you know, with this company. Uh, and ideally, yeah, try to meet the founders uh, if you can, uh, especially if there is not much public information. If, uh, um, you know, if you can't find any inf information on the, on the founders, it's, it's usually a red flag. Uh, but again, you want to be avoiding the any companies that promise promising you some excessive returns, you want to avoid, uh, yeah, founders with no track record, with no, let's say, with no public information available on them.